Tadeusz Kościuszko was a nobleman, a general, and an exile, an engineer and an artist, and a legend in his own time. Hello, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm Lucy, and on this episode, I'm going to be discussing the life of Tadeusz Kościuszko, ambiguous icon of the Age of Revolutions. As this episode will make clear, I think he was extremely cool, and that more people should have history crushes on him. This is the first half of a two-part special, because there are just that many cool stories in the footnotes. I picked Tadeusz Kościuszko as a topic largely because I'm originally from Philadelphia and I think more people should know about our adopted hometown boy. If you visit Philly, you can visit his house. It's in the 18th century historic district. It's just not as famous as, you know, the room where the Declaration of Independence was signed. Before starting research for the podcast, my knowledge of Kosciuszko was primarily local. I'd seen his house and statue when I was a girl. I knew him as a man who had hung out with Washington and fought in two revolutions. But the more I researched, the more interested I became, not just in his life, but in how that life has been remembered and forgotten. So this episode is going to focus on his life and how his biography has been crafted, and part two of this Tadeusz Kościuszko special will focus on him as a pop culture figure, despite the fact that he still doesn't have the big budget miniseries he deserves. Before getting to his most miniseries worthy exploits, I'm going to take us back to the beginning to Tadeusz Kościuszko's pre-heroic history. I'm not going to give you a blow-by-blow account of Kościuszko's upbringing and education, but these things do matter to understanding both his position in society and his perspective on it. His family was part of the Szlachta, the Polish gentry, but they weren't very well off, partly because Kościuszko's father voluntarily gave the 31 families who worked his estates a much bigger cut of the produce of their labor than was required by law. So while still working within this paternalistic and unequal structure, he was committed to making things more fair. Also, the Kosciuszko family belonged to the very minor gentry. If a Jane Austen analogy helps, think of the Bennett family in Pride and Prejudice. As the youngest son of the family, Tadeusz was always expected to be educated for a career, and that path had some unexpected bumps. He left one school because his family couldn't afford the fees after his father died and subsequently enrolled in the new military academy in Warsaw. He was both ambitious and gifted, distinguishing himself enough that he attracted the king's notice. And this personal relationship almost certainly influenced Kosciuszko's choice to leave Poland rather than get caught up in an anti-royalist uprising. While he did share the rebels' zeal for reforming the structure of Polish society, he also believed that the king could and would bring about these reforms, After all, this was the age of constitutional monarchy. This is to say nothing of the fact that openly rebelling against a king who had been nice to you personally would be an extremely bad idea on just about every level. So he opted out taking sides, instead spending time in Paris. Always a good idea. While in Paris, he studied art and also, crucially, hung out with the subversive playwright Beaumarchais. Beaumarchais not only wrote an influential trilogy of hilarious plays about subverting class and gender hierarchies, which I've discussed in another episode linked in the notes, but also literally wrote a letter to the King of France telling him that he was a jerk for, one, ignoring the partition of Poland by Russia and Prussia, two, allowing slavery. How, he asked, can you allow your subjects to take by force and bind suffering black men whom nature made free and who are only miserable because you are powerful. Well, might he ask. Clearly, the impact of this letter on French history was approximately nil. But I mention it to illustrate the fact that this was a historical moment when a very expansive range of egalitarian possibilities was envisioned as possible, even though many of them did not come to pass. Kościuszko returned to Poland in 1774 after the rebellion had ended in a failed kidnapping of the king and a partition of Polish territory among Russia, Austria, and Prussia. Also, Kościuszko's older brother had squandered his inheritance and mortgaged the estate, so Tadeusz couldn't afford a commission in the army. 
And this meant that he had to find another career than the one he had been trained and educated for. So he did the 18th century equivalent of couch surfing, visiting successive friends until Lord Zosnovsky, who had recommended him for Warsaw's military academy, helped him out again by hiring him to teach history, mathematics, and art to his two daughters. Now, if you've read a non-zero number of historical romance novels, you may guess where this is going. But there is, interestingly enough, disagreement about what exactly the extent of Kosciuszko's romance with Ludwika Sosnowska was. According to the memoirs of several of Kosciuszko's friends, it ended in ignominious failure. Tadeusz and Ludwika attempted to elope, but were stopped by her father at the head of a group of armed men who took Ludwika back by main force after knocking Kosciuszko unconscious. Helena Filipovich has questioned just how much of this story can be believed and how much of it was made up in the 19th century as romantic embroidery. Alex Storzinski, meanwhile, has argued that it was the defining moment and defining passion of Kosciuszko's life. Because the episode was apparently told by Kosciuszko to multiple friends and thus confirmed in a range of secondhand accounts, I'm inclined to say, yes, it definitely happened. I would also argue, though, that there's no real evidence to say that it was the emotionally formative experience of Kosciuszko's youth. But in any case, after this incident, Kosciuszko fled Poland again to avoid being prosecuted, killed, or both by the enraged Lord Zosnowski. He returned to Paris to reconnect with friends there, including Beaumarchais, who by this point was helping to funnel men and supplies to assist American forces in their war for independence from the British crown. And it was thus, through his friendship with a playwright and because of his training as a military engineer who could both devise and draw plans, that Kosciuszko got involved in the cause of the American Revolution. You may be thinking, finally, something that goes right for the poor guy. However, because of the British blockade, Kosciuszko's ship had to go through the Caribbean. They sailed at the beginning of hurricane season and got shipwrecked. Kosciuszko rescued himself by clinging to the ship's mast and swimming to shore. And after this, he and his fellow volunteers managed to get up the coast to Philadelphia in a small fishing vessel. Kosciuszko finally made it to Philadelphia in August of 1776 and went straight to Benjamin Franklin. I would say, as one does, but Franklin himself was rather startled by Kosciuszko just turning up at his shop and offering, in French, to take the officer's placement exam and offer his services to the new nation. After an interrogation, Franklin told Kosciuszko that he was convinced of his noble intentions, kissed him on the forehead, and said, you have to admit, young man, that it was pretty unwise to travel 2,000 miles without any commitments or connections. Unwise or not, however, Kosciuszko arrived with expertise in military engineering the revolutionary cause desperately needed, and in short order he was put to work by Congress devising defenses for Philadelphia in preparation for a British attack on the city. It's at this point that military historians go into starry-eyed detail about Kosciuszko's achievements. And this is fair. They are impressive. But you can find out about them fairly easily if that's your thing. I am not going to spend a lot of time discussing the details of his strategic activity. But this was both significant and recognized as such at the time. Kosciuszko served as an adjutant general. That is, he was helping, often decisively, to manage campaigns rather than independently managing his own forces. At multiple points throughout the war, military commanders would write letters back and forth, essentially begging for Kosciuszko to spend time helping them. Washington says it's my turn with the Polish engineer. But in all seriousness, his strategic expertise was, without exaggeration, unique. It found its fullest expression in the two years he spent fortifying West Point as the key link in a chain of fortifications preventing British control of upstate New York. These fortifications either ensured the territorial cohesion of the rebellious colonies, or if the plans got into the hands of the British, dun dun dun, might not. Most American schoolchildren learn at a young age about the terrible treachery of Benedict Arnold, who tried to sell key American plans to the British. What generally doesn't make it into those elementary school narratives is that what Benedict Arnold was trying to sell were Kosciuszko's drawings and his designs. 
And once Kosciuszko had left New York for the Southern campaign, in response to one of those pleading letters, begging that Washington would brighten a more than gloomy situation by sending Kosciuszko down, Arnold simply took them. This task was made easier by the fact that Kosciuszko had been staying in a boarding house instead of luxurious quarters like Arnold's own. But it was also a betrayal that no one saw coming. In the words of the man who wrote to Washington about it, the most surprising thing in the world. While Benedict Arnold was doing this, Kosciuszko was heading south. Crucially, he was doing so in the company of a black man named Agrippa Hull. Hull, known as Grippy, was by his own account the son of an African prince, and was known for both his intelligence and his wit. He was a free soldier in the Continental Army, and had served General John Patterson until being transferred to Kosciuszko's service. An 1894 biography of Patterson says this is because of the attachment that developed between Tadeusz and Agrippa. Hull served as Kosciuszko's aide-de-camp from then onward, and apparently developed a genuine friendship with him. A story that, according to the same 1894 biography, Hull used to tell about their relationship involved a disguise and a hangover. When Kosciuszko left to inspect fortifications, Hull hosted a party in his tent for all the black men of the camp, enslaved and free. He himself donned Kosciuszko's uniform. The 1894 account says that the party were drinking wine freely and were very hilarious. So, when Kosciuszko returned unexpectedly, the tipsy partygoers were as alarmed as if Satan himself had suddenly appeared, and all of them, including Grippy, feared reprisals. But what Kosciuszko did, apparently, was to raise Hull to his feet, saying, it is beneath the dignity of an African prince to prostrate himself at the feet of anyone. And what happened next is a strange little story allegedly retold by Hull himself in later life when he was a landowner in Massachusetts. Together, Kosciuszko and Hull paraded through the camp, with Kosciuszko introducing Hull, still clad in his own uniform, as an African prince, a claim that was taken seriously by non-zero members of the encampment. Toasts were then drunk in his honor, at considerable length, by the officers. Again, allegedly according to Hull, he was punished for his original breach of decorum by the hangover he had the next day. As I say, it's an odd story, but as I interpret it, Hull and Kosciuszko seem to have been on the same side of the joke, coping with the boredom and tension of a military encampment by satirizing, albeit in different ways, how identity and clothing were tied together in 18th century society. I lean towards such an interpretation largely because Hull and Kosciuszko remained friends for years after the war, but more on that later. I think it matters that Hull and Kosciuszko traveled together into the American South because this would have affected how both of them experienced it. When they reached Virginia and Monticello, Kosciuszko was genuinely surprised to discover that Thomas Jefferson owned enslaved people. It is a paradox that Americans have been wrestling with ever since, that the man who wrote All Men Are Created Equal enslaved other human beings. Kosciuszko was livid and wrote letters to Jefferson about it until his death, when he left money designated to buy the freedom of Jefferson's slaves, making Jefferson the executor of his will. Jefferson refused, but the documentation of how all that happened survives. A historical record, again, of alternate possibilities. But to come back to the Southern Campaign of the Revolutionary War, I am deliberately focusing more on the social history of this than the troop movements, because this period appears to have sharpened Kosciuszko's ideas about, and commitment to, truly equal rights in a democratic society. Kosciuszko is working alongside Nathaniel Green, the commander of the Southern Theater, and also, as a devout Quaker, very committed to the anti-slavery cause. Kosciuszko was not only figuring out how to navigate rivers in order to move men and materials, but also working with spies. His most recent biographer reports that he was particularly successful because of his rapport with the black men who moved in and out of British encampments on errands. And this is one of those things that makes me want more footnotes. What does it mean to have rapport with networks of enslaved men who are risking their lives even more clearly than white men in the same position would have been by running information. And how does Kosciuszko develop this rapport? 
history being what it is, we may not be able to answer these questions with perfect confidence. But we do have Kościuszko's letters, proving that he worked closely with the black informants who were so crucial to the American war effort in the Southern campaigns, perhaps with the not unreasonable expectation that a brand new republic dedicated to principles of equality might abolish slavery. While Agrippa Hull does not appear as an agent in these exchanges, I do see it as fully plausible that he would have been able to vouch for Kościuszko's trustworthiness, and perhaps even more importantly, for the fact that Kościuszko would trust the information given him, regardless of the social status of the person bringing it. Since Hull worked as Kościuszko's aide-de-camp, they would have been collaborating closely on a daily basis. And as I mentioned earlier, they seem to have developed a genuine friendship. Over a decade later, when Kościuszko was visiting the United States, Hull traveled to visit him, since it was hard for Kościuszko to move after having been disabled in the fight for Polish independence. I'm emotional about it. Kościuszko's work on the Southern Campaign was mostly unshowy and not terribly dramatic. He did once get stabbed while laying explosives near a British-held fort. He made it back to the American lines, where he was then made fun of, mercilessly, for being bayoneted from the rear, the literal butt of jokes. He appears to have minded this much less, however, than the time when he and Green, due to a supply line issue, were cut off from their coffee supplies. He wrote a letter stating plaintively, I cannot live without coffee. We've all been there. Kościuszko's coffee habit, indirectly, also helped him to get back to Poland after the end of the war. He returned to Philadelphia, where he tried, unsuccessfully, despite Washington's support, to get the brand new US government to actually pay him. This was something he had in common with all the soldiers in the revolution. He was promoted to brigadier general, but this did not make him less broke. However, Kościuszko's regular coffee shop was also frequented by Chaim Solomon, a prominent Jewish broker who had been personally funneling funds to the revolutionary cause throughout the war. He was also Polish by birth, meaning that he and Kościuszko would have had a language in common, and Kościuszko's letters seem to indicate that they both felt the poignancy of belonging to multiple cultures. Whatever the causes, Solomon lent or gave Kościuszko the money to get back to Poland. By the time our Tadeusz returned to Poland in 1784, his oldest brother had squandered still more of the family income. Moreover, he arrived at a time of simmering tensions regarding political reform and Russian intervention. An old friend, Prince Czartoryski, welcomed Kościuszko warmly, but when Kościuszko went to the royal palace, his reception was more frosty. Kościuszko is, of course, dressed up for the occasion of asking for the military commission he cannot afford as a favor from the king. And this includes wearing the Medal of the Order of the Cincinnati, that George Washington personally gave him. Now, the story of Cincinnatus is another of those founding Republican myths, known to school children in ancient Rome and the US alike. At least, I definitely learned about him in fourth grade. Cincinnatus is the ideal citizen. A former consul of Rome instantly leaves his well-deserved retirement, leaves his fields half-plowed, and leads the army to victory before returning to his modest existence. So, Kościuszko is wearing this medal, guy with plow, Latin inscriptions saying he left all to serve his fatherland. And according to an eyewitness account written down later, the king came close enough to Kościuszko to take the medal in his hand and read the inscription out loud. The eyewitness reported dryly that the king did not find it good, and that Kościuszko replied that he thought it was very good. So, Kościuszko did not get his commission. It's at this point where I am going to give you a very brief précis of Kościuszko's absolutely crucial role in the fight for Polish independence, and say stay tuned for more in the second episode. And I'm making this choice largely because it is as a hero of the Polish Revolution that Kościuszko was remembered and indeed mythologized throughout the 19th and early 20th centuries. We'll also get into his West Point statue next time. But I think it will be easier to talk about plays and operas and films next time without saying, Hey, remember when we discussed that big battle last time? So here's the short version. Kościuszko, having avoided open rebellion against the King of Poland over a decade earlier, now decided that the time was ripe for revolution. And I mean this in the least cliched way possible. Having fought in the American Revolution, having worked alongside Agrippa Hull, having befriended Chaim Solomon in his coffee shop, Kościuszko was convinced 
that a Europe full of better, more open, more egalitarian societies was just around the corner, just the other side of a wave of revolutions whose time had come. Yeah, I'm also sad about how he was wrong. Despite overwhelming odds in the form of the military forces of the Russian Empire, Kosciuszko and his literal ragtag band of peasants wielding farm implements were successful for a time, but only for a time. How Kosciuszko pulled together people from diverse backgrounds and with diverse interests to fight for Poland is very moving to me, and I will spend more time with it next time. But winning against the military might of the Russian Empire long term is something that is very hard to do. And Kosciuszko did not pull it off. He was left for dead on the field of battle and spent two years in Russian imprisonment before being released in an exchange of prisoners. Via a series of intermediate stops, he returned to Philadelphia and to his friends there. One of his connections was the renowned physician Benjamin Rush, who commented in a letter that he thought Kosciuszko might be able to walk again someday. This issue of Kosciuszko's mobility and how it affected his identity is another thing that I will be spending more time on in the second half of this podcast. While in Philly, one of the consequences of his injuries was that he spent most of his time at his house, drawing and receiving visitors. One of the men who visited Kosciuszko was Mishikinakwa, otherwise known as Little Turtle, an influential Miami chief and diplomat. While Kosciuszko's biographer says the chief called on Kosciuszko, Mishikinakwa's biographer says Kosciuszko called on him. Because this was socially important in the late 18th century, I looked it up in the 1834 collection of biographical sketches of Native American leaders that the anecdote comes from. Apparently, they became attached to each other. No details on how this happened, though I am dying to know. And on their last and most famous visit, Mishikinakwa called on Kosciuszko to say goodbye before returning to his people. On this occasion, Kosciuszko gave him two gifts. The first I have found mentioned in no contemporary histories, but the 1834 volume describes it as an elegant robe made of sea otter's skin. Not only does this sound amazingly warm, but it also suggests to me that Kosciuszko found or commissioned this robe, worth several hundred dollars at the time, in the style of indigenous rather than European dress, and I love that. The second was a pair of handsomely mounted pistols, which Kosciuszko exhorted Mishikinakwa to use against, quote, the first man who tries to subjugate you, unquote. This is, of course, an amazing line, but more importantly, it suggests that Kosciuszko, at this precise moment in 1797, saw possibilities for a different unfolding of history than the one that took place, one in which the new Republican government of the United States would create equal rather than exploitative agreements with the indigenous peoples of North America one in which Mishikinakwa could, as chieftain of the Miami, make treaties with the US, with Britain, with France. One powerful leader among others. Like many of Kosciuszko's other hopes, this one did not come to pass. But I personally want to live in the future that Tadeusz Kosciuszko tried and failed to craft. This and all of our footnoting history episodes are available captioned on our YouTube channel. Thank you for listening and subscribing, and until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.